Boyan from Storepool, he will be presenting a disaster recovery solution. Hi guys, um, we have like a, a special present for uh, 10 lucky winners in this room. Um, so in front of you, if you find a gray box about this size, find us in the coffee break afterwards to get your uh, uh, swag <laughs> from us. Um, so um, this is, so Storpool, our agenda today. Uh, we're going, going to talk about a specific requirement that a customer approached us with and how we uh, solved that, that with Open Nebula and Storpool. Um, and as a background for who they are and what they wanted, they have a VMware EMC and data domain environment today. Um, they are starting with a test environment, like a private cloud test uh, dev environment today, moving to production later when they, you know, when they like how it works, etc. And they were looking at uh, Red Hat Enterprise virtualization and they were also looking at OpenStack, but we, we kind of guided them in the direction of maybe you want to do this with OpenEagle instead of uh, OpenStack. Um, and I think they, it was a good solution, for, uh, like good decision for them, I think, at the end. Um, and the DR stuff is not in production today, but they really want it in production in 20, 2018. They are uh, a Middle East financial services company, so this is kind of um, this is an indication that uh, this kind of technology is getting more adoption into more kind of conservative uh, IT departments. So things which were kind of you couldn't think of a fin financial services company using, uh, say, KVM, it's now b becoming more common, right? Um, and moving on to how a typical uh, store pool slash open nebula setup looks like. Um, some, you know, they call this server porn. So you have, um, on, on the left side here in the middle, you have three storage nodes, three store pool storage nodes, and under them you have 10 hypervisors. Mm -hmm. And then each hypervisor has uh, four times 10 gigabit ethernet. Um, why four? So it's two, two times four storage and two more 10 gig ports for everything else. Um, and this is kind of on the more uh, segregated end of the spectrum. So they have separate network for storage and they also have separate hypervisors, but you can also build these environments with storage on the hypervisors and just two times 10 gigi. Just depends on your level of um, kind of tolerance towards coupling, coupling, coupling between the, the different components of the, of the system. Then, um, uh, optional parts of this kind of deployment, uh, you could have, say, dedicated servers for open nebula controllers, or you could run the open nebula controllers on storage nodes. You could have a backup server, uh, or and you could have uh, additional locations for DR or additional locations for primary sites as well. Um, so why why do people do it with Storpool? It's so this is a, a kind of characterization of a very small storage system, very small meaning it, it just has three storage nodes with four SSDs on each, and it's a, a latency versus IOPS chart, and this basically tells you that this system can do uh, 300,000 random reads plus writes um, in about half a millisecond average latency per IO. So at, at, at this kind of, this data point here is something like 2.4 gigabytes per second going back and forth from, from the uh, 12 SSDs in, in the system. So it's quite a significant uh, amount of traffic. Um, and kind of in, uh, with real, realistic workload, what you would see in IOSTAT of hypervisors is something like this. So, so you would see, um, say, uh, so the yellow is on, on the right chart. So you would see less than a millisecond of average weight, which includes waiting in the hypervisor for kind of this data to get streamed through the network, right? Um, and how does Storpool work with Open Nebula? Um, there is a, a Storpool Open Nebula add-on, which we, we uh, develop and maintain. It um, is 
without sounding too grandiose, is may, maybe one of the best uh, st storage plugins in terms of say, feature set and uh, things it, it can do. It obviously requires a, a storable storage system underneath, but um, it does everything that um, kind of the storage plugin hierarchy in OpenAvila supports, plus additional things. So it enables you to do things like um, not having to have a shared file system for a system data store, being able to import images in, in other uh, formats, um, does something called, we call last resort fencing, so uh, when you a hypervisor fails, we detach store pool volumes from the original hypervisor, and et cetera, et cetera. Right, so may, maybe one more. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So the disaster recovery <coughs> requirement itself. So when we, when we first got approached by them and they said we want a DR solution, uh, the first thing that came to mind was um, kind of this canonical how people imagine disaster recovery. You have two sites, they're both connected to the internet and then uh, something happens in one side, it explodes, and then you want all your vir virtual machines to start in the other side. That, that's what we imagined. Um, in reality, it uh, turned out that it's a lot more, it, it's slightly different. It's, the requirement itself it, is a lot more nuanced. So it ends up with, um, so this is kind of some more detail on the requirement. You have two sites completely independent from, independent from each other, two completely separate storage systems, so you can't have something like uh, a magical storage system that spans both sites and then if one site dies, you still have access to the same data. That's not allowed by, by the requirement. Uh, two separate controllers, and initially it was uh, in the requirement it said separate networking, uh, but it, they ended up doing a shared network between the two sites. So they have the same IP addresses, the same kind of network spanning both sites. And uh, this number two there, so the ability to migrate virtual machines between sites, that's, uh, that's the part where it differs most from what people imagine by DR. Um, so this means that uh, so this is a private cloud environment, there are tenants, users of that environment, um, and a user at any time may decide that they don't like the primary site for whatever reason. So say it, it, has, uh, it has some connections to uh, out, the outside world and these have failed in the primary but they still work in the DR site for example. The user doesn't like the primary site and they need, the user needs to be able to move just some of the virtual machines from one, one of the sites to the other. So it ends up being, because of this requirement, uh, it ends up being uh, kind of a, the ability to move, the requirement becomes the ability to move virtual machines between sites with the minimal amount of downtime that, that you can get. Uh, on demand by the customer, and then you also have the kind of DR set, uh, the full disaster in primary site, where then the infrastructure team goes in and boots up all VMs in, in, in the DR site. Um, they, th these guys specifically, they decided they don't want to have automation for this. They, they want kind of the DR, DR event is triggered uh, when the team decides that the primary site is not salvageable. So it's, like it's not coming back, start up everything in the, in the DR site. So how does it work? Uh, like a very hardware-centric picture of this. So you have two storage systems, networking in both sides, hypervisors in both sides, open able controllers in both sides. Yeah. Um, and underneath the hood, uh, so you have uh, open able federation, so you have the two, two controllers with internal redundancy in each side. Uh, user can go in and uh, like, uh, and from an end user's perspective, they, they can move from site to site and control uh, VMs in each of the sites. And they, uh, the way this works in OpenAvila is um, you have one identity that, uh, so, so only the identities are synced between the sites. In OpenAvila it's not like a full database replication, it's only, only the identities. Um, so users, in this way users can get resources in primary site and also some resources in, in, uh, in the DR site. Uh, then you have store pool storage systems in both sites. Uh, we use uh, uh, functionality in store pool for sending snapshots between sites. Um, 
you can think of that, so if you're familiar with ZFS, that's in a way similar to ZFS send, uh, but not 100%. It's our own thing for uh, moving snapshots between sites. And then we wrote um, similar kind of a similar concept to uh, what was presented in, in the previous session. We wrote tools that live outside of Storpo and Open Nebula. They talk to both systems through uh, through their respective APIs, and they uh, the, kind of the, this external DR uh, orchestrator um, manages all the steps required in order for, for the DR process to work. So what is the DR process? So you have, um, in the primary site, you have a set of virtual machines. Uh, the user goes in and adds a label to these virtual machines. How, this is how uh, kind of the DR solution knows that the, these VMs need uh, DR functionality. When you do this, um, what we do is uh, we find these VMs, we copy their metadata to the DR site, we start creating periodic snapshots in the primary site and sending these snapshots from one site to the other. And uh, hence, in the, so it's at one DR, so this is in the, in the DR location. Hence, in the DR location, you get virtual machines with all of their, uh, you know, let's say, uh, virtual disks, uh, network settings, uh, name, etc., cetera, um, which are identical to the ones in the primary site. And you can just go in and start one of them. And when you start one of these VMs, you, you, you will get the latest snapshot that was uh, fully transferred uh, from one side to the other uh, under the virtual machine. So, sure. Why, why periodic snapshots? Like, why not? Why not? So, like, why periodic snapshots? Uh, so the idea is you have your application running in, running in the primary site, and you want uh, kind of the... the you want all, all the changes you can capture to, to the, say, the, there was a database in the primary site and th there was some, uh, you know, transactions going on on that. Um, you want that to be synced to the DR site. So basically, like a change, like every snapshot is just a difference. Yeah, and we transfer just the, the differences. Uh, so ideally, you would want that to be, uh, so that's called um, like recovery point. Uh, you want the recovery point to be exactly now, like you want all, all, all your data preserved. Uh, however, there may be some limitations. For example, how big the link between the two site, sites is. For example, uh, how far away the second site is. Um, and do you want coupling between the two sites? So if you do f synchronous replication, for example, um, which is not the technology we, we propose for this, if you do synchronous replication between the two sites, then you create coupling between the two sites, meaning if something uh, kind of delays the replication in, in the second site, that will also affect the primary site. Just as synchronous works. So the idea here is from an end user should just mark the virtual machine that this we, we want the other functionality for that VM. And then the system underneath uh, sends periodic uh, snapshots from one site to the other, and uh, at any time, as an end user, I can log into the uh, DR site and select one of the, the VMs and boot it up. Doesn't like that, That's the user experience we, uh, we wanted with this. So, the way this works in the background is that um, you have, uh, say, scripts working in the primary site, scripts working in the uh, DR site. Both of them talking to the respective Open Nebula uh, and Store Pool instances. Uh, and you, you, can, you can treat the two sites as uh, symmetric, meaning uh, you can do VMs in one, VMs in the other, and send some, uh, some VMs running in primary site, and they have a DR, a DR clone in the DR site, and some VMs running in the DR site, and they have a VM clone in the primary site. And you can do um, failover and failback, right? So for uh, with their respective uh, different RPOs. So for for fail, um, when it's user initiated, it 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 is um, today when a user initiates one of these, it, you it shut down a VM in one side, bring a VM in the second side, and you don't you don't lose any of the changes 
in the way. If it's a disaster, then you, you lose, say, a few minutes of uh, the last changes. That's the overall concept. So um, why, why do, do, did we want to talk about this? Um, implementation of this call, so with existing site-to-site uh, -site capabilities in Storpo and with uh, existing unmodified OpenEDL, so there were no, to develop this thing, there were no changes required to OpenEDL itself. Um, which means that we were able to extend OpenEDL just by external programs talking to the OpenEDL API and also talking to the uh, Storpo API, right? Uh, which means that you know, it's a good extensible system, uh, fairly simple to extend it. Uh, and uh, developing a solution like this uh, would have taken like a, a traditional vendor uh, maybe a, a few many months of work. It, ju it took, us, took us just two weeks, right? Um, so that's, that's that. Any questions? Uh, do you also preserve the ID of the templates between bo both sides? Or mm -hmm. are they newly registered templates? We preserve the ID, Anton. Okay. Yeah, we did. Okay. Just I, I didn't write it, so I, uh, my colleague confirmed yes, we preserve it. Okay. Uh, so we had, like, for uh, the next generation of this, uh, we want to get to a point where you can live migrate the VM between two open Ebola controllers. Uh, for that, we would need, uh, like, we, it will need some more work on the open ABL site as well because of uh, conflicting identifiers. So the virtual machine identifier needs to be preserved and we count because there may be a VM already running with that ID, right? Um, yeah. Cool. Nice to see you. Uh, hi. Uh, is there any safety measure uh, preventing uh, the same machine from running on both sides? And also, in, in uh, such a case, how would you handle split brain? So yeah. So um, if you, when you start the VM in the GR site, if there is a connectivity to the primary site, it will actively go and stop that VM. Um, so if you're doing kind of manual failover, uh, it's assume that both sites are online and it would work between them. Uh, in a DR scenario, so if the primary site is down, uh, then it's assumed that there is an external party making uh, like external failover, external sort of fencing. Uh, so you need to do things like uh, in any uh, high availability solution with failover, you need to do things like disconnect the primary site from the network. Because uh, otherwise, um, that there is no way of ensuring that it wouldn't just come back online and the VM still running uh, on it. Um, on the fencing side, we like within each of, of these clusters, we, we do um, some of that for failover between hypervisors. So if a hypervisor dies, we ensure that even if if it's still running, uh, and, uh, it, it won't be able to say corrupt the data in the storage system. Um, but be between sites, it's still assumed that um, when you trigger the DR event, you also, one of the kind of checkpoints in your procedure is disconnect primary sites from the network, right? Because you don't want yeah, that to happen. Uh, and uh, it's also, we also ensure that even if the primary site come back, comes back online, it doesn't, doesn't can't affect the virtual machine that's already running in the DR site. For example, um, you know, it's still generating changes in the storage system. You don't want these propagated to the already running VM in the DR side. They're just lost, right? Okay. Anyone else? Cool. So, um, reminders for anyone who found one of these uh, gray boxes that they should be kind of uh, in, in the front of you uh, just talk to us in, in the uh, coffee break
and we'll give you a small present. Thank you.